of some, to some food or any time during the presentation or afterwards. Uh, please help yourself to food and drink. My name is Mark Wolf, and I work in the Special Collections and Archives Department just down the hallway. And today I'm here to welcome the library speaker series, Conversations in Standish. This is the Standish Room. Today's guest speaker is Dr. Jim Schwab. Dr. Schwab works in the University at Albany's Atmospheric Sciences Research Center, where he conducts research in the field of atmospheric ch chemistry. The major theme in his research involves the study of chemical and physical processes impacting the fate of anthropogenic and biogenic emissions and their effects on air quality, the climate system, and global cycles of atmospheric species. With colleagues from his department, Dr. Schwab has monitored long-term measurement sites at White Face Mountain in the Adirondacks and Pinnacle State Park in the New York State's southern tier. At these sites, he make, they make continuous year-round measurements of more than 20 chemical and physical parameters. They work closely with the New York State's DEC at their New York City sites and have conducted three special studies in Queens uh, in New York City in the past decade. For the first campus conversations and standing uh, event of the spring 2019 semester, Dr. Schwab will give a presentation titled Air Pollution in New York State, Where Do We Stand? Please welcome Jim to the podium. Okay, thanks, Mark. I think there are more 15-cent words in the introduction than the rest of the talk, so it'll yeah. be a little easier yeah. going forward. But um, as Mark said, I work at the Atmospheric Sciences Research Center and have been there for, for 30 years. And uh, I tell people it's my dream job, and, and I've just had a really fun time. But first of all, I want to acknowledge a lot of the people who have made this um, you know, possible. And, and at the top of the list is our funding source, uh, New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, and my program manager, Ellen Burkhart, um, who have been very, very supportive and, and helped make this possible. Um, also critical to this is the people who really do the work, um, as, as I've kind of transitioned to much more managing, is, is my research group. Um, the the full-time employees, Rich Grant, Will May, John Spicer, my lab manager, Janie Schwab and my four grad students who are very productive and, and a couple of them are here as well. Uh, Hashem, Hassan, Joe Mardo, Matt Ninnam, and Jijang, former members. As I said, I, I work at a great place and very delighted to do so at ASRC. Um, so all of, all of the interactions at ASRC have been very great for my career. And I've worked very closely with New York State and a number of agencies mostly the Department of Environmental Conservation, but also the Department of Health, the Northeast States Coordinated Air Use Management, and others. And finally, I want to give a shout out to my, my mentor and, and former director, Ken Demersion, who started many of the long-term measurements program my, my group has, has benefited from. So with that in mind, um, I want to bring out some of the critically important issues, environmental issues, that the, we are faced with as a species. And this is a partial list, but it's the ones that I think we, we all know about, and I'll end with the one I'm going to talk about today. Climate change and climate variability. Uh, there's some experts in the room here in, in that area, and they can tell you more about that. Uh, what I do impacts that, but it's not directly in that field. Extreme weather, again, we have many experts here in this university on extreme weather, and that's an important area of synergy, both with atmospheric sciences, social sciences, emergency management, all the things that we do so well here at Albany. Water pollution, this is a really big one. Fortunately, we live in the Northeast where we have clean water and copious clean water. It's not the case in a lot of places around the world. And, and this is a big problem, particularly for developing countries and arid regions. And last but not least is air pollution, which I'm going to talk about today. Um, there's a, this sort of breaks down into a couple of types of air pollution. There's the ambient air pollution, which is what's outside when, we're, when we are outside as well. And then there's indoor air pollution. I'm going to talk just about the ambient air pollution. That's my area of expertise. 
atmospheric scientists and chemists typically look at what's in the ambient or outdoor atmosphere. There's a lot of engineering work, mostly on indoor air pollution, also very important. Uh, that would be another topic for a different day. Just to kind of lay, continue to gray, lay the groundwork, what are some of the adverse health effects that are attributable to ambient air pollution? Well, according to the World Health Organization, the biggest one is premature death. And they, the, their statistics, their best estimates are that about 3 million premature deaths occurred in 2012 due to air pollution. So that also, another statistic, another metric that one can use for adverse health effects is years of life lost. And that becomes important. And disability adjusted years of life if you're, if you're disabled because of a, of a disease. We also often try to associate emergency room visits with ambient air pollution. And that's important in the epidemiological field. I'll mention that briefly in the next slide. So these are quantifiable metrics, and they're used to gauge adverse health effects of air pollution. Specific health effects that we know about that have strong, robust epidemiological evidence that are, have relation to air pollution are, not surprisingly, the first one, acute lower respiratory disease or distress. The most common one of these would be <coughs> asthma. So, makes sense, air pollution and asthma are linked. But also circulatory diseases, like uh, obstructive pulmonary disease, stroke is related to air pollution, heart disease, and then again, kind of logically that makes sense, lung cancer. So for all these reasons, this is why we are so interested in this topic. How does my group's research fit into this? It's obviously a big picture with many different fields involved. Well, we do air pollution characterization. Okay, so we try and understand what is out there, what might be affecting our health and well-being. And this helps us determine air quality, and you often see these air quality alerts uh, if you look at the papers or your computer or television, and the air quality influences a number of things. As I've talked about, it influences human health, okay? It also influences ecosystem health, and kind of the poster child for that is, is acid rain, acid deposition. And it also affects our economic well-being because all of these adverse health effects have economic costs as well. On that particular topic, a really important point I want to want everybody to remember is that in a number of peer-reviewed studies, but one of the most extensive in 2011, tried to gauge the benefits and costs of the Clean Air Act from 1990 to, to 2020. And on average, on average, this study estimate that the benefits exceeded the costs by a factor of 30 to one. So there's uncertainties in this, right? So what's the best or the worst case scenario what if, you, what if you take the, the, the limits of both the costs and the benefits? Well, that ratio could be as high as 90 to 1, but it's very, very unlikely to go lower than 3 to 1. So no matter which of these estimates you take, it, it's pretty clear that the benefits that we have, we have seen from Clean Air Act greatly outweigh the costs. And to, just to be, you know, straightforward and honest, most of the benefits are avoided health care costs. And so that's the issue, those health care problems I mentioned. If we reduce those dramatically, we reduce our health care costs, and that's the major benefit. So there are other kinds of benefits, just economic welfare in general. 
and there's much more in the report, but I think this aspect of air pollution regulations really does not get the emphasis and attention it deserves. As we all know, there are certain people within our society that think all regulation is bad no matter what. Well, I'm pretty skeptical about regulations myself, but the ones that work, we ought to be celebrating. Going back to the first economic, or the environmental issue that I mentioned, there is an important co-benefit to air pollution reduction. And that is that reductions of air pollution invariably occur simultaneously with reductions in greenhouse gases. So these two problems have co-benefits. And you've often maybe heard of it in terms of a, of a, of a co-benefit of climate greenhouse gas mitigation as being reduced air pollution. You can also turn that around. The, the co-benefit of reduced air pollution is reduced greenhouse gases. OK, so getting on to really what our research group does, we have a number of um, <coughs> measurement sites and, and Mark mentioned a few of them, give you some pictures and some, some idea of where these are. So up in the Adirondacks at Whiteface Mountain, right at the top of the mountain, we have a building owned by the University of Albany where we do measurements and have been doing them since the 1970s. In the southern tier of New York, here out past Elmira and Corning, we have a site at, located at, at Pinnacle State Park where we started measuring in the, in the mid-90s. And then in New York City, this is in cooperation again with our partners at New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. There's a site at the Queens College campus where we are fortunate to be able to share some space and we have some of our measurements and, and as Mark mentioned, done a number of special studies there so that's been a, a, a great relationship with New York State and with Queens College. A few data slides. As I mentioned, we have measurements at Whiteface Mountain going back to 1975. And so this is kind of really a, a very important and, and, and kind of impressive data record for ozone, which is an important trace gas, a pollutant, but also important for all kinds of atmospheric chemistry. And so you can see that, that the average annual ozone at this station has varied over the years, up and down a little bit, level throughout the late 80s and 90s. And I'm going to focus on this slide on the fact that it does seem to be trending downward a little bit over the last 15 or 20 years. We have to take it with a grain of salt because the stuff that happened before that, we've had ups and downs and, and other things. But that's kind of what we want to see, and we'll talk about ozone a little bit more in a minute. We also have sort of the more uh, directly emitted pollutant gases, and they are also trending down, particularly in the last 10 or 15 years. This is carbon monoxide. And these levels are quite low, getting very near continental background at our white face mountain site. Um, oxides of nitrogen, quite a bit different. At this site, they peaked in the mid 2000s. But since then, there's been quite a dramatic reduction. This also is a function of air pollution regulation. But really, the poster child, the best story that we could tell in terms of air pollution regulations and how they have actually cleaned up our air is with sulfur dioxide. So sulfur dioxide is almost entirely emitted as a byproduct of combustion. If there's sulfur in the coal or fuel oil or whatever fuel you're using, and so we can the emissions of that are actually tracked. And this is a little older slide, only goes to 2010. But it shows you, going back to the late 80s, 
the emissions that have been reported to to EPA and that they have come down about 3% a year for these uh, almost three decades. How does that end up affecting the atmospheric concentration? Well, this is our measurement of SO2 at Whiteface since 1996. And so for this 25 or almost 30 year period, it came down quite dramatically as well, even faster than the emissions. And there are reasons for that, but the most important thing we want to see is that they're really tracking each other very well. And finally, just to kind of add a little icing to the cake, the final um, destination for the sulfur in the SO2 is often in rainwater precipitation sulfate, which is acid rain, sulfuric acid, measured as sulfate, and this is also at Whiteface at the Lodge, and showing the measurements against going back to the mid-80s and coming down pretty consistently. There's some year-to-year -year variation, but over the course of this period, it's also reducing about 2.5% a year. So the other thing to look at here is not just the amount per year, but the total change, about a factor of four here, factor of five or six, it's come down. And this is zero. This is truly zero on these plots. And here, the it came down almost a factor of four in concentration. So these are real successes in getting rid of this precursor um, and, and producer of acid rain. We can look at the three different sites that I, that I showed you. Um, on the left is, is Whiteface Mountain where the, PP, where the concentrations of SO2, we have an upper scale here of four, here of 10, and here of 16. So they're slightly different scales, but in each case they're all coming down and they're actually approaching levels at our remote and rural sites where it's becoming a challenge to measure them. Um, that's a good thing. Certain, certain things you want to put yourself out of a job for. The very dramatic reductions, like over 80%, in New York City for sulfur dioxide. So that's really the shining success story, the best one. If we look at particulate matter, aerosols, soot, the, the, the dirt in the air that we breathe, very small stuff, but, but dirt nonetheless. Um, we also fortunately see reductions in the past decade or so sometimes a little longer. Not as dramatic. We're coming down 30, 40, 50 percent, maybe a little more. But this is all very good because most of these health effects that we mentioned are very sensitive to this particular pollutant. The, the, this is the pollutant that is most often um, robustly associated with the adverse health effects. And so there's a lot of interest still in reducing this PM pollution, this particulate matter pollution even more. So this is the long-term measurements work that we have been doing that Ken Diversion started and our group has been involved in and, and we continue to do with NYSERDA support. What we call the precursor gases, those that are directly emitted from smokestacks and the like have decreased significantly over the past 20 years. And this again is a case for the regulations doing their job because these, um, these are, this is the result of, of air pollution regulation. <clears throat> the PM 2.5 has also come down. And again, there's been a lot of attention on this. It's, 
not quite as straightforward because there's a lot of sources of PM 2.5 and, and colleagues at ASRC and our group working on, on that. So it's, it's a little more complicated. And even more complicated in some ways is, is the question of ozone. It's a little trickier. The highest summertime ozone concentrations um, have been coming down. Last summer might have been a little exception. I'll talk about that in a minute. We got some very hot ozones in the New York City metro area. Um, the background is up. And the stricter standards that have been that have been put in place as the Clean Air Act standards get reviewed periodically have made it even more difficult to meet those um, meet the standards. So here's a picture actually from I realize this is like only last week this came out. This is the evaluation by the Environmental Protection Agency of how well people are meeting the ozone standard. And you can see large areas of the country that are clear are in attainment, are meeting the ozone standard. But there are many areas, and mostly it's well, major metropolitan areas, well a lot of California, <coughs> Phoenix, Dallas, Houston, Denver, Chicago, and so on. Um, so there's still some issues with meeting this ozone standard. And if I zoom into the Northeast, we see that the whole corridor, I-95 corridor, from Washington, D.C. right up into Connecticut has an ozone problem. And where is it centered? Right in the New York City metro area. So northern New Jersey, downstate New York, and coastal Connecticut. Ozone exceeded the air quality standard on 19 days last summer. And, you know, it's something we're, we're working very hard on. Why is it so difficult? Well, I'm putting up three reasons. There may be a few more, but I mentioned that the air quality standards have been made stricter um, recently, 2015, I think. EPA, the Clean Air Act requires EPA to review the air quality standards every five years. And generally speaking, we're getting better and better at the epidemiology, understanding the adverse health effects, which are the drivers of the standards. And so the standards often come down. And So the stricter air quality standards make it a little trickier to be in compliance. We also have increasing background values. So there's kind of a, two things going on. The standards coming down, the background's going up. So a relatively small amount of production of ozone in the urban area causes an exceedance of the standard. So those two things are certainly at play. And the third one is really more of a research question and something our group is very working very hard on. Complicated chemistry and physics. I'm not going to use 15% word, I'll just use complicated. We have pretty good understanding of the very polluted conditions and a pretty good understanding of the very clean conditions. So if it's a really polluted environment, we know what to do to kind of make it less polluted. It's a very clean environment. We also understand the chemistry, and we just try to keep it that way. We're very much in a transition region in a lot of a lot of the U.S. at this point, and the chemistry becomes much more complicated. And that there's certain things like the sea breeze circulation, which we'll see in a minute, other things that that, that make it very uh, interesting, but but more complicated problem. So that's where we are, um, and working very hard to improve that what we saw back here. 
so we can get all of the Northeast into attainment with this standard. So a few of the just snippets of what we have done as a research group recently. Last summer, um, there was a multi-organization field campaign called the Long Island Sound Tropospheric Ozone Study, or LISTOS, LISTOS 2018. Uh, Jia Zhang over here was out with our mobile laboratory measuring ozone, uh, particulate matter, nitrogen dioxide, a few other things um, with on-road deployments. We were housed at Flax Pond Marine Laboratory where our colleagues at Stony Brook were, were generous enough to let us work out of that, that location as we were looking at pollution on Long Island. You saw Long Island was one of those areas that was in moderate non-attainment. So on this day, first day of a multi-day air pollution episode, uh, Gia took the, the laboratory, the mobile laboratory from the Flax Pond site and drove it south to the south shore of Long Island. And if you look at the scale here for ozone concentrations, the white is low moderate, get to moderate ozone, high moderate, and then starts getting high and very high. So across almost the whole island, things are in the moderate to low moderate range. And then it gets very close to the to the south shore, starts to go up, and then boom, it goes through the roof. Really fascinating. You know, what what is going on here? We're convinced and we need to do a better job of completely explaining it, that there are emissions from the city that kind of go out over the ocean and then are carried back in by the sea breeze circulation. And as they come and, and converge near the shoreline, and depending on the, the meteorological conditions, it can be very different, you get lots of production of ozone in a very narrow geographical area really interesting stuff and you know I've been in this business for 30 years this is one of the more interesting things I've seen um, also out of Flax Pond uh, Everett Joseph's group a couple undergraduates and, and Janie um, did ozone sound balloons so here's some nice pictures inflating the balloon attaching the payload just about to let go of the payload with the balloon in the air at this point and the balloon going up over Long Island Sound. So the, here's some of their early data from this. Uh, this is actually part of that same episode. This is two days later after that van excursion we just showed. At, at the surface, the ozone is again moderate Humidity is very high. Humidity quickly goes down as you go up, and then goes down even more as you get above the boundary layer into the free troposphere. But what we see is the ozone bumps up almost 20 parts per billion as you get to 400 meters above the ground, and then kind of dips back a little bit, and then you get a layer of very high ozone, well over 100 parts per billion, up over a kilometer. Um, and so there's definitely ozone production going on. It's not always at the surface. Sometimes a little bit aloft, where these emissions come together along with the sunlight and, and the other precursors that are necessary. So this is another um, study that's going on. And we have a, a, a UAlbany undergraduate who's actually leading the analysis on this. Um, and there'll be more balloon launches this summer. Project that, that Janie is working on with Everett as he continues the effects of fog on aerosol chemistry. The fog part of it was kind of serendipitous. Uh, we didn't really go out there looking for fog, but the fog found us and, and Gia has managed to turn that, that kind of 
unexpected situation into an interesting study as well. Okay, so that's some of the things that our research group is doing. And I want to give you a few final thoughts as I end up here. Uh, the Clean Air Act and its amendments, along with the competent regulatory framework, all those guys who were furloughed, <laughs> guys and women, many important women, have been successful and provided a very high economic benefit to cost ratio. Very important, and I want, I hope you can all remember that. We can't get complacent, though, because there are some problems that still remain. Uh, I haven't mentioned it here because we were talking about New York State, but I think everybody's heard that there are developing countries, especially um, China, India, and big uh, mega cities in, in Africa, uh, where they're struggling with air quality problems. You know, like, like we did in the 70s, there's kind of a, you can almost see the timeline. You know, there's industrial and economic growth causes a lot of pollution. People are economically better and realize that they're in polluted conditions and decide that they need to do something about that and regulate it. And so we're hopeful that they get to that point very soon and can follow the example of the US and Western Europe in, in, in using thoughtful regulation to help. As we talked about a fair amount, New York City metro area and other regions of the U.S. still suffer from high air pollution too often. <clears throat> and there's no, there seems to be no lower threshold for these health effects. People always wonder, well, is there, a, is there a lower limit beyond which it doesn't matter? We haven't found it yet. So if you're a sensitive person or if you've been sensitized by being in in high pollution conditions, anything can cause, um, can exacerbate that. And then one thing that, that's something that's, I like to bring out and, and just to be, that we need to be careful of unintended consequences. There are things like, maybe some things at very, very low concentrations, but if it's particularly toxic, we need to be careful about it. And as we get into more manufactured substances, we just kind of be vigilant. Now, the example I use is that PFOA is in the water supply. You know, they're trying to lower the limit on that to something like 10 parts per trillion. That is kind of unbelievably low concentration, but we know that it's a bad thing even at those very low concentrations. So we want to make sure that we're not setting ourselves up for that. And with that, I will uh, say thank you and be happy to take questions. Yes, sir. It's maybe a little off topic, but in terms of the funding pie, and the um, urgency over climate change and so forth, do you feel like it's harder to get your work funded? Um, it's, a good, it, it's good work, but because it doesn't have climate change directly written right over the top of it, um, have you had any problems with that? So it's a, it's a mixed bag. I mean, as I said early, you know, I've been very fortunate to have a great program manager at NYSERDA and you know the air quality and health is one of their points of emphasis and so they do fund that within New York State. Now at the national level it is tricky because kind of a natural place for s some of this work to get funded would be EPA and EPA has drastically cut back over the last five or ten years on externally funding research. Um, so that's tricky. And then as you, when you go to um, National Science Foundation or some of the other agencies, you're right, it's, you, you really do have to work in the climate change angle. It's usually not horribly difficult 
to do because there's such important linkages between the two. Um, but we're very fortunate in New York, I'll just put it that way. New York has been, you know, and, and the other thing is is that the governor has taken on the mantle, even more so, not that he wasn't good on the environment before, but I think with the retrenchments at EPA and other places, he has decided to kind of reinvigorate the environmental aspects of, of uh, his support for New York research. So, um, you know, there's, I guess that's my answer to that question. Yes? You clearly showed that there were regional differences in the readings that you were receiving, like what New York City was receiving was different from the Adirondacks. Yep. What are you getting in the Southern Tier? What's it showing? What are the trends? I granted that you haven't been tracking it as long as what you've been doing on Whiteface. So, um, so I showed you SO2 and, 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 and particulate matter in the Southern Tier. Um, we're not really, there, there is, actually there's a program, I don't have any of that data here, unfortunately, because it's, I'm kind of doubling down on the stuff that we've had for a long time. So this is the SO2 in the Southern Tier, okay? Um, and this is the particulate matter. So it's a pretty clean rural location all in all. We are working with um, University of Rochester and, and SUNY Plattsburgh where they are measuring methane down there and trying to see like is there influence from the fracking in Pennsylvania and things like that. And uh, there are measurements also of toxic organic pollutants that we have like every three or every six days. Um, we definitely see some instances of plumes of, of high concentrations. It's not, uh, it's not predominant, you know, but it, I think it depends on where you are and what the meteorology is doing for you. So it's, it's, it's definitely occurring there. There's, there's also some concern that actually all the diesel truck traffic due to that is potentially increasing some of the pollutants that are related to diesel truck traffic. And that's again, colleagues at the University of Rochester. Some of this is kind of speculation because we don't necessarily have, you know, a, a uh, you know, smoking gun. But there are some indications. So certainly all that activity <coughs> is is producing greater emissions. How much of it is, is getting as far away as we we're measuring it? Um, not been really quantified that well yet. Yes? Oh, no, 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 um, so regulations can mean a lot of things. I think in the, in the context of the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, um, I'm all for it. You know, there are certain regulations. I know people who own small businesses in New York who think they're overregulated, and there probably are in some cases. You know, so that's what I'm saying is that you can't just say that every regulation, I, I would not say that every regulation on the books in, in the country and in the state is good and needs to be there. These do, okay? And these have, have proven their worth. I'm just, so that's, that was my story. Not about air pollution regulations, but about regulations in general. Sure. In, in those uh, uh, Dana displays, uh, what what could you explain? The, yes, the I'm sorry, I should have done that. Means this is called this is called a box and whisker plug. Yeah. 
and and so the the and there's a little there's a little um, legend up here, but inside the box is a line for the median and a dot for the mean. The box itself includes all the data from the 25th percentile to the 75th percentile of all values measured in that year. And the whiskers range from the 10th percentile to the 90th percentile of all the values measured that year. Oh, so this oh. is this is a, a all the hourly values that we have for a given year. Now we actually have one more. You know, some years we don't get instruments break down, things happen. We don't get a full data set. So, for example, in this year, we had less than 50% of all possible data. And that why that's why that is shaded a little differently. So, so, so the and then the finally the the dotted lines are running means. Okay. So, my, so can, do you make anything of reduced variation in the yes. measurements as time has gone it, by? Yeah. It, it all it all it all matters. And you know this is this is a very broad brush annual average. There are, there are seasonal things. There are you know weekday, weekend, you know, people do lots of yeah. digging into the data in much more detail. Yeah. So this is a very broad brush, but you're absolutely right. The, the decrease in the, in the range yeah. is also quite important. You know, you can see back in the, in the early 2000s, even at Whiteface, we had much more high values, you know, kind of plumes of pollution moving in and that's relatively unfrequent they're, they're, these, these 90 percentile bars don't go as high or as far as they used to yeah can you account for this phenomenon is it due to better regulation or yeah people are just you know there's just not as much um, coal burning and there's not as much sulfur to make secondary PM and so yeah it, it all kind of is is works together so to help reduce both that, both the mean and the range. Yeah so that when there's coal but when there's a lot of coal burning there's a lot of variation in the in the uh, in the uh, in the emission of the pollution. There's just and much we, more out there and depending upon yeah. how the meteorology brings it to your station. I mean, we're not measuring in all places at all times. This is a single point, okay. you know. Yeah. Right. Is there anything that the individual can do to change the quality? Well, what the individual can really do is be mindful that, I mean, I'm talking about ambient air quality. Can you do much for ambient air quality? Well. You know, have a cleaner car. If you burn wood, burn it cleaner, hotter, with less emissions. Um, that will help. Uh, probably more important from an individual point of view, it would be to be mindful of indoor air pollution. Um, you know, if you're, um, you know, burning with, cooking with gas or heating with wood or something like that to be mindful of what's inside your house. Uh, and that's not really my field, but I think you know that's another very important exposure route is what you're breathing inside your house. So, so filter your air, um, you know, make sure that appliances are running well and, and, and so on. Um, so that will help reduce your exposure probably more than you can do for the outside ambient air, but certainly running cleaner fuels with cleaner burning is better. Buy an electric car. I have one. <laughs> yes? In one of the slides, in one or two slides before that, you had shown uh, time dependence of uh, emission at the left one. Yes. It's flat for a while and then drops. 
No, 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 no. That's that's the regulations. The regulations kicking in. There were there were two phases of the of the uh, uh, Clean Air Act controlling sulfur emissions, and so that's that's totally related to the Clean Air Act uh, regulations and, and reducing the sulfur emissions. Yeah, pretty impressive, huh? Yeah. So I'm yes. just wondering, do we have any function from? There are there are a few measurement locations. Actually, GIA has a paper out for the fireworks, Independence Day fireworks, from 2017, and it turned out to be, from a measurement point of view, a perfect day because it was very calm and the winds were just very weak easterlies. So the plume from the Empire State Plaza where they blew off the fireworks kind of slowly over the course of two hours wafted the emissions over to the campus here and he, uh, he got some spectacular measurements that were, that were his, have been written up and were trying to get published. Um, but there are some Measurement locations within Albany. Uh, I have I put in one proposal that didn't get funded to do some very local monitoring, where are the hot spots and things like that. I mean, I think that, as you probably know, that most of the monitors that are operated by the New York State are what are called community monitors. So they're meant to be kind of away from major sources and what is this region as a whole seeing as air pollution? Well, I think one of the more important things going forward is what are the hot spots where, you know, people don't necessarily live at the Loudonville Reservoir. You know, they live in small communities with streets right nearby, um, perhaps some sort of industrial facility, and, 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 and there may be some hot spots of pollution that that we should be aware of. But so, so to answer your question, probably not as much as we might like. But there are some resources, and I can point you to them. Do you need to? Are we doing on time? Uh, we're almost there. Is there maybe one last question? Yeah. Please. Uh, do you um, do you work with uh, other states? Just to change information, to see what they're doing, like our neighbors, like Pennsylvania, for example. So, absolutely. So the um, this project had air quality managers from all of the surrounding states involved in daily phone calls. And then there's something called the Northeast States Coordinated Air Use Management Association or something. It's a crazy name. But, um, and, and they, they work together. Because I think behind your question is the fact that, you know, the air doesn't know where the state boundaries are. You know, air is just going to move around where it moves around, where the physics tell it to move. And so um, all of these things become cross state lines. And so what happens next to northern New Jersey and what happens in coastal Connecticut are all very closely linked to what's happening in New York City and on the I-95 corridor as I showed. So yes, so we do we do very much work with them. Um, unfortunately Pennsylvania not as much, but we certainly had a lot of involvement from Maryland, uh, Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Maine, um, Rhode Island uh, on this project. And, and so that's not uncommon. Yeah. With that, let's give Jim another round of applause.